Hello and welcome to the Attorney Post, where we give you the inside scoop with top attorneys in their field. And now here's our host, Justin West. All right. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Attorney Post, where we discuss what's going on in various facets of the law with lawyers at the top of their game to help you navigate the various ins and outs of the various legal fields and jurisdictions. Because as I always say, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. Today, I am very pleased to be joined uh, by Jonathan Leveritz. He uh, runs the Leveritz Law Firm out in New York City. It is a family law practice. And we're going to jump over and take a look right now. Uh, Jonathan, how are you doing today? Doing okay. How are you doing, Justin? I am doing just fine, other than the crazy polar vortex that uh, people are uh, experiencing over most of the country. We actually have warmed up. I'm looking at my uh, looking at my thermometer outside. We have warmed up to one degree. We finally crossed after like 48 hours into the positive. Cross that zero mark. <laughs> we crossed the zero mark. There we go. I was, I was telling uh, Yanni a little bit before our, our, our pre-roll uh, about the issues we were having. I thought our heater went out, thought our pipes burst, and it all wound up being about a, a $90 fix. So it's one of those days. Hopefully, you guys, wherever you are, you're out there, you're doing well. Um, before we get started, I do want to jump over and take a look at his website. It is leveritslaw.com. As always, we will have a link in the description down below. Uh, that is leveritslaw.com. Uh, you can call them at 718 718- Nine four two four zero zero four. Uh, we'll make sure we have all of that information down below. So if you're watching this on YouTube or any of the podcast repositories, you'll be able to find that. But uh, Yanni runs the Leverett's Law Firm, and they are a uh, you know functionally full service New York City family law attorneys. So that's what we'll be digging into today. Before we get started, as always, we're going to jump over and read from our sponsors. Our first sponsor at the top of the hour is NationalERC.org. You may have noticed that the world went through a pandemic and many businesses were forced to shut down. They had reduced hours, supply chain interruptions, and ultimately suffered from reduced revenue in 2020 and 2021. What you may not know is that Congress passed the CARES Act, which allocated $400 billion in stimulus funds for small businesses that never needs to be paid back. It's not a loan like the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program. It's essentially free money for your business that can be spent whatever way you think makes the most sense. And right now, NationalERC.org is helping small businesses get the maximum amount of of money that they can, and you can calculate and see how much you could get back by visiting nationalerc.org. The average small business that they work with gets back over $200,000 to invest in their business, and that's money that never needs to be paid back again because it's basically a retroactive tax credit. Visit nationalerc.org to learn more. The calculator is always free, and there is never any fee unless they secure funding for you. Visit nationalerc.org. Our second sponsor is Groove Funnels. If you love spending $5,000 to build a brand new website, you love paying monthly hosting fees of hundreds of hundreds of dollars for a platform that lets you, you know, host webinars and sell things to your customers or your clients, then by all means, keep doing whatever it is you're doing. But if you're like me, I hate that stuff. And that's why I personally recommend Groove Pages, the all new all-in-one website funnel sales platform from internet marketing, marketing legend, Mike Philsane. Uh, right now you can visit the attorneypost.com slash Groove and sign up for free to build a complete website at no cost. Really, truly no cost, no credit card required. You can actually build, I believe, up to three fully functioning websites. They have a huge list of apps on their website that basically makes it a Swiss Army knife to do anything you'd want it to do, from being a webinar platform, a sales funnel platform, website, blog, uh, as well as an affiliate program. Basically, if you can imagine it, you can build it and you can get started completely for free. Visit theattorneypost.com slash groove. All right, there we go. Well, uh, again, I am joined by Jonathan uh, Leveritz. Uh, he goes by Yoni, uh, which is a, uh, is that the Hebrew or Yiddish version of, of Jonathan, I believe, uh, Jonathan? Hebrew version. Either you, Hebrew version. Uh, and he is a yes. pretty prominent figure, I think, in uh, the legal community in New York City. Um, he has been working in the fields of matrimonial and family law since his admission to the New York Bar in 2005. Uh, he has made a significant impact to the establishment of the law uh, office of the original name, <laughs> the law office of uh, Jonathan Leverett, or Leverett's Law Firm. Again, link in the description down below. Uh, his approach is, uh, according to his website, a holistic approach, addressing a wide spectrum of legal issues with a team of diverse legal experts ensuring comprehensive solutions for his clients. He's earned top ratings from Martindale Hubble and has been consistently recognized as a super lawyer, underscoring his expertise and success in his field. His practice, primarily focused in New York County uh, and the surrounding areas, is renowned for representing uh, a number of individuals, uh, including some celebrities, but we won't name that here, <laughs> um, and particularly focusing on things like father's rights uh, in the, the realm of family law. Uh, his commitment extends beyond his legal practice. He has contributed to various legal publications and he's actively involved in 
in various prestigious legal legal associations as well. Uh, his combination, his very unique combination of experience in business, civil law, and security trading provides him with invaluable insights, further enhancing his ability to achieve success and outcomes for his clients. That was kind of a mouthful, but I'm sure I missed a lot uh, in that brief little overview. So my first question to you, Yoni, is what did I miss? Well, basically, it's not a matter of what you missed. It's a matter of the fact that uh, it's a lot more in terms of the description of what the firm does. When you say holistic, what exactly does that mean when it comes down to a divorce firm? Okay, so there are many times in divorces where people go ahead and do somewhat foolish things, such as transfer money to other people, or their father, their mother, their brother, their sister, Um uh, transferring property, transferring shares, transferring uh, businesses. Um, well, that's called a fraudulent conveyance because you're about to go through a lawsuit and you're about to go through other proceedings. That's something that we would handle. Now, if you're just thinking about a divorce and you're just on shaky ground with your spouse, there are issues like postnuptial agreements. And of course, you know, before you get married, there are prenuptial agreements, which fall into the realm of contract law. And then, of course, we've got other issues such as asset protection. You know, sometimes it pays to go ahead and protect your assets and try and develop trusts and trust funds and other types of, um, you know, uh, uh, legal uh, maneuvers to go ahead and work with your spouse to a certain extent to go ahead and protect assets and to go ahead and protect those assets from lawsuits, from creditors, or even to protect them from a future divorce litigation, okay, which is also possible. Okay, now I don't handle that particular part of the work. We have Ravi Patel, okay, who handles that. But uh, in general, these are different maneuvers that are possible when you're talking about a holistic divorce firm, when you're talking about someone who's going to come in there, who's going to deal with someone who's hiding cash. I mean, I can't tell you how many businesses go ahead and uh, pay people off the books or pay people uh, uh, in general just to, uh, you know, uh, not show up for work or to show up for work at the wrong times or the wrong places. And these are the types of things that we can look into, whether it's through a lifestyle analysis, through a forensic accountant, or whether it be through just uh, backtracing uh, the actual inventory that was purchased by the business. So. Wow. We do a lot of different things. We're part private investigator, part divorce lawyer firm. A forensic divorce attorney. <laughs> or something to a certain along extent, lines. yes. <laughs> That's fascinating. I've never really seen that. Well, you sort of gave it to me already, but but give me your pitch if I didn't know anything about you. Why do people choose your firm over other firms? What do you guys do? Uh, you know, you're holistic, obviously. You you delve into things a little bit like right here. But but if I didn't know you, give me your give me a 30 second pitch. We care. Unlike other divorce firms where they're looking at numbers strictly, we actually, we care whether we win or we lose. We care about the result that we can produce for a client. There are times when we tell clients, listen, this is just not going to work out for you. And listen, we have to cut our losses. Um, we look at uh, basically, you know, the cost benefit analysis of moving forward uh, with the uh, process itself. Um you know, which is something that uh, I don't think a lot of divorce lawyers do or a lot of lawyers do. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so well, you've been practicing, you've been, you've, you passed the bar in New York in 2005. So we are going on year 19 right now. Uh, so almost two decades of, of serving in New York. What got you into law and what in particular got you into family law? My divorce, uh, like uh, many other people who end up in this situation, I was actually sitting on the client side of the table 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, you know, and uh, by litigating custody with my lawyer and litigating child support with my lawyer and or, or lawyers, you know, I mean, the average person goes through two to five lawyers, I would say, between, you know, their first lawyer through their fifth lawyer in terms of, uh, you know, not getting along with their lawyer, not agreeing with their lawyer. Uh, personality conflicts, so on and so forth. Um, you, I, I basically just fell into it. I mean, there was a time where, you know, it's it's all I did, it's all I knew because my life, to a certain extent, was dedicated to my case and to my child and to uh, my life. So hmm. that's what got me into it. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, so you just decided to take the bar, pass it, and become an attorney because of your your struggle. Now, I, I've not heard a lot of people mention the statistics on how many attorneys somebody goes through in the process of finding a, a divorce attorney or custody attorney, et cetera. Um, and, and you think the number sometimes is as high as four, five, six attorneys? Is that is that sure. common or that's crazy? I've never, I've never encountered that. I, I would say the average is two to three on, on, for sure. I mean – um, people start off with one lawyer, they're not happy, they move on to the second. By time you're number lawyer number three, you figure that there's going to be a lawyer number four, five, and six. <laughs> I mean, it's just the way it happens. Because at some point in time, it's really not the lawyers that are at issue, it's the clients that are at issue. So clients are not getting along with their lawyers, or they're just having a bad result as a based upon the system. Gotcha. Um, whether it be judge, whether it be adversary, whether it be better facts on the other side, whether it be their expectations are too high. Gotcha. Okay. So they, people go through multiple lawyers. How do you manage client expectations? What do you, what do you do when someone comes into your office and, you know, they want the moon and, and, and then some. Me personally, I try and explain it and talk them back from the ledge. I try and explain the situation in general and explain that there are so many moving pieces to this system. You can't have expectations that are too high because you've got a judge. You've got a judge's law secretary who's going to be involved in the case. You've got an adversary who's going to be involved in the case. If you have children, there's probably going to be an attorney for the children or child involved in the case. And then there's you. OK, you're the attorney. So then you have at least five moving pieces, OK, to keep track of at any given point in time. Then if you start getting in deep into the litigation, you'll have a forensic doctor possibly involved with the children. And then you'll have a forensic accountant possibly involved in business valuations. You're looking at seven people uh, in the average litigation that you have to deal with, manage their expectations comply with their wishes at the same time dealing with them and explaining to them the facts of the case from your client's perspective and backing that up with raw data. Raw data is a lot of the times the key to this. Many lawyers don't spend enough time sending out subpoenas, uh, getting out enough uh, demands for discovery and inspection to collect enough data to show why their client believes a certain thing, why they believe their husband or wife is earning cash why they believe business deductions aren't good and valid. So again, these are things that are coming into play. And if you can't prove them, well, then you end up with a situation where the client is going to be very disappointed because they believe it exists. Okay. And you have to manage that expectation beforehand and explain to them, listen, if we can't prove the cash, what are we going to do? We're going to do a lifestyle analysis. So you move from front to front, looking for the ability to prove the client's case. And sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. What goes into a lifestyle analysis? Is that like looking at their spending habits, looking at, um, you know, if they're, they, I, I honestly, I'm just not even sure about that. I'm sure some people would have questions. What What is a lifestyle analysis and how does that play into helping them? Well, uh, I'll take an example. A uh, person drives a uh, Porsche Mercedes, lives in a $1.5 million home, but claims on their tax returns that they're making uh, $125,000 a year. Well, they're obviously not making one twenty-five, dollars right? But what are they making? What can we prove to a court? What can a court hang its hat on? We bring in a forensic accountant. The forensic accountant is going to look at the expenses and the costs and what it would take for them to live the lifestyle they're living. If they're on a jet set lifestyle going to uh, Turks and Caicos seven times a year, going to the Middle East to travel around just for fun, then at that point in time, you're going to have a situation where you're going to be able to prove some of that spending, not all of it. OK, but some of it, the big pieces will be there for the forensic account. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I would imagine a lot of people don't do it because it's a lot of attorneys don't don't follow up with that because it's just a lot of work and they don't want to they don't want to do it. Uh, why? Why? Why else would an attorney not if they're trying to represent the best interest of their clients um, go to those lengths? Well, I actually do see a lot of attorneys going to, to those lengths. I see a lot of people who do lifestyle analyses or actually make applications for lifestyle analyses. 
but a lot of them don't follow up with it because a lot of them don't realize the value of it. They keep thinking, you know, I'm going to prove the cash flow through the business. I'm going to prove the cash flow through the subpoena, through the American Express statement, or through just looking through bank statements. They don't realize that this tool is available and should be used more often. Gotcha. That's interesting. Um well, let me ask you, I'm going to back up for a minute. I'm just kind of curious. I, I've talked to a couple of uh, attorneys in New York City. One of my longest running clients actually is a, is in New York City. And I, one of the sponsors I read from at the top of the hour was nationalerc.org. They're helping businesses that went through COVID and whatnot. But obviously, as, as a country, we just went through a pandemic. God willing, we're done with it. <laughs> it's not going to come back. But I'm curious, living in uh, in New York, how did the pandemic affect you and how did it affect your firm? Did did you guys see a notable shuttering of you know not a lot of clients? Did you see a spike in clients because all of a sudden people were stuck living together? I found that so many different people have had so many different experiences. I'm always kind of curious about that. So if I can, um, how, did, how did the pandemic and, and the response to the pandemic affect you and your firm? At first, the pandemic caused a lot of people to be uncertain in terms of being able to afford counsel and in terms of being able to afford um, the process of moving forward. But that was pre the PPP loans and pre the SBA loans and pre the, you know, CARE Act and and, and pre, you know, all these different types of uh, uh, bills that came out, okay, to help people monetarily speaking. Um Restaurant owners did not want to move forward with their divorces. Uh, business owners did not want to move forward with their divorces. Um, people who were in uh, business in general, um, as, as uh, one uh, hedge fund manager put it, they wanted to stick to their knitting, okay, and stick to their home base. People were very unsure of things. And then as we came out of the pandemic, you saw a lot of people who were willing to take the risk with the money and take the risk and say, listen, you know what? I really hate this person's guts, especially after being with them for so long, cooped up in a house for uh, whatever the pandemic was in terms of how long they had to remain at home. OK, and then they went ahead and they filed for divorce or they went ahead and moved forward with their divorces. That makes sense. But I mean it doesn't <laughs> slow down at first a lot. And then it kind of just resumed normal because I, I I've literally talked to um, a dozen, two dozen, three dozen different family law attorneys across the country, and each one has a very different experience, which I just find fascinating. A couple of them like, no, everyone tells you that divorce has skyrocketed, but I found like they plummeted. Other people like, no, I've never been busier than during the pandemic, and so it really seemed almost like it was a, a case by case basis. I have a, a couple of friends who are injury law uh, attorneys in New York City, and uh, one of them he is in a building that. On, on a regular day, sees over 80, 90,000 people walk through its doors. And he said in the highlight of COVID, he had 150 people walk through that building uh, on a daily basis. Like it just, it shut everything down. And to, to think of a city like New York City being so desolate, it just is, uh, is fascinating. Um, how's the, fam how's the, the, the landscape of family law uh, in New York City evolved over the last you know 19 years? Have there been any really big changes in the the way that you approach law have there been any really big changes in the the landscape of of the the legal realm when it comes to family law in new york city over the last you know since since 2005 it's been huge i mean we've had so many changes it's it's hard to keep track of them we've had no fault divorce go into effect i believe in 2010 we had uh, a new maintenance law uh, for interim maintenance that went into effect. We had a new law that went into effect for interim and then post-divorce maintenance went into effect. We had a law that, uh, you know, basically started moving around with the caps in terms of child support, in terms of maintenance. Um, you know, so we've had lots and lots of changes in terms of the law since I first started. But some of them have been good and some of them have been, in my opinion, not so good. It really depends upon the situation. Um, you know, I would say for payer spouses, people who are making money and people who are saving money, I would say these laws have been rather harsh on them. For people who are um, the non-moneyed spouse, the person who's not making money, the spouse who's... Uh, trying to freeload to a certain extent or in or is just a freeloader. I mean, not even trying to freeload, but they are just a freeloader. Um, they have made out OK as a result of some of these laws. Gotcha. Um, I'm 
kind of fascinated that that I thought no fault divorce was a thing that's been around a lot longer. Is that something that New York had specific laws against, and so something changed in in twenty ten? Yes, absolutely. We only had grounds for divorce. You had approved grounds for divorce, or you had agree upon grounds for divorce, which was the more common thing. Okay, and then in twenty ten, we had became a no fault state. Gotcha. How do you feel about no fault uh, divorce? Is that a is it a good thing, a bad thing? Is it I mean just a thing that can be used for good or bad? Is it what are your thoughts on that? I like the idea of having fault in divorce and I know I'm in the minority and I'm probably in a very very small minority. But um you had the opportunity to go ahead and and protect certain rights and remedies when you had a fault for divorce. And that's because, for example, the I, I deal with the large immigrant population in the Russian community, right? So the ability to go ahead and use the uh, grounds for divorce, which were more commonly accepted by judges then because they needed grounds for divorce in order to get people divorced. So you had the ability to tie the immigration and the divorce issues together. Under the Violence Against Women's Act, for example, if you got cruel and inhuman treatment as part of your divorce, you had the ability to tie those two things together and work with the outside counsel on an immigration issue to basically help that person be granted status here in the United States. Now we don't have that as much. Now we have, you know, irretrievable breakdown where the marriage, you know, was uh, broken down for a period of six months or more prior to the start of the divorce action. OK, and that's what judges expect you to do. They don't want people fighting over grounds for divorces. They want to streamline it. So it did take away from that immigrant population the ability to use um, the divorce laws to help them with their immigration issues. Huh. That's an aspect I don't think I ever would have sussed out on my own. That's really kind of fascinating. Um, huh. I seriously never thought about it in that capacity before. So let me ask you this. You've been practicing for, you know, going on 19 years. Congratulations on that. You know, it'll be uh, two Thank decades you. next next uh, next year. Um, I am sure in your experience of law, you have had probably some big wins and some things you're very proud of, but also some setbacks, some some things you would even consider to be a failure. Uh, my listeners know I'm a, I'm a firm believer that, you know, failure is only really failure if you fail to learn from it. Otherwise, it's it's a slow burn win. So if you don't mind me asking, can you tell my listeners, Yoni, about a time in your practice of law where you failed, when you experienced something that might have felt like the, the world was ending at the moment, right? Um, but but what did you learn from it? And how do you how do you carry that forward to make sure that you're taking the best care of your clients moving moving forward? I think it goes back to about 2007. I suffered my my biggest loss, in my opinion. I lost someone custody of their children. Um which I found to be absolutely devastating. I'd only been practicing for about two years. And instead of cutting a deal, which would have allowed the person to have um, more time with their children, even though they still would have lost custody, they would have gotten more time than what the judge gave them. Um, it, it was devastating. Um, I mean, the loss was horrible for the client and the loss was horrible for me. Um I mean, there was no way we were going to take custody, but we would have gotten probably closer to 50-50 if we cut a deal rather than uh, going to the trial. And that was because I did not guide the client properly. I should have told the client, don't go to trial, settle this out, as opposed to trying to be nice to the client and saying, listen, I understand you want to go to trial, uh, but I think it's a really horrible idea. Now, I just tell people the way it is. Um then I, I was, to a certain extent, I, I wanted the client to feel I was doing whatever they wanted. Uh, but sometimes what a client wants is not necessarily what's good for a client. Gotcha. No, that makes perfect sense. I mean, you are there. That's your, your, 
you're the, I don't use the word expert. I know that's a guarded term in the legal realm, but at the same time, you know, that's, that's what you are. You're, you're the, you're the Sherpa, right? You're there to guide them through the process and, and know the path and, and whatnot. So I think that's amazing. How do you, how do you handle the negative emotional aspects that come along with family law, particularly, you know, in sensitive cases that involve children? How do you, how do you manage expectations um, when, when children are at play, when there's you know domestic disputes, violence, et cetera, how, how do you, how do you personally manage that? And how do you help your clients manage that? In terms of dealing with the clients, you're really doing a lot of handholding. You're really just kind of trying to walk them through the process. You know what the factors are that the court's going to look at in terms of fostering the relationship, uh, which parent is better at it, you know, which parent is going to provide a better lifestyle for the child or children. You know the factors that a court is going to look at for the most part by looking at the case law. So you can coach them in terms of how to act, how to behave. Um, in terms of managing expectations, you basically tell them up front, you have no idea what's going to happen. And that's because there are too many moving parts. What happens if the attorney for the child comes in and sides with the father when you represent the mother? And she just doesn't like the mother. Well, that's an unforeseen thing for the most part when you're picking up a case. Okay. Or you have an attorney for the child who simply doesn't speak up in court. And the child is voicing one thing and the attorney for the child is simply moot. They're, they're just standing there. They're not voicing anything in court. So you have to explain to people that this is just an unknown entity with too many moving pieces and too many moving parts to guide them properly. We can teach you how to behave. We can walk you to the water, but we can't get you to actually drink it. Okay? It's 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 a process. You have to go through it, and it's important to understand it, and you have to be educated in it. But on the flip side, there's no real knowing what's going to happen. It's simply too fluid. Um. I asked you a minute ago about one of your biggest failures. And uh, obviously, again, I think failure is a good teacher. But I'm sure you've had a couple of really big wins as well. And probably a lot more wins, hopefully, than than failures. Um, but I'm sure there's one or two things that you've accomplished in your your 19 years that you're particularly proud of. Can you can you share with our listeners, Yoni, you know, one or two of the things that you're just most, you know, when you go to bed at night, that's the, the thing that you think about as you're falling asleep or the the feather in your cap, so to speak. Well, I, I, I'm proud of what we've done in terms of uh, criminal cases on behalf of our clients, in terms of the number of times that we've had clients found not guilty of violating orders of protection and things of that sort. But if we're asking about feather in the cap, I would say one of my best moments, okay, as an attorney was when we had a jury trial on a postnuptial agreement for violating a confidentiality provision and the jury came back with uh zero dollars in damages and the court awarded one dollar in damages when the claim for damages was in the millions and millions and millions of dollars so and it was you know a hedge fund manager against his ex-wife and you know basically what it came down to was is she bad mouthed him in the media and violated the confidentiality provision um, uh, and this is based upon the court record, not based upon, you know, what, what actually, you know, transpired in the case, I guess you'd say, but, um, it was just very interesting. And then the bottom line is the, the jury saw it for, saw it for what it was. It was a case where they couldn't prove any damages and it was just impossible to show. It was completely speculative in nature. When so the court uh, that was a nice win. When they award $1, is that actually even more insulting than just leaving it at zero, which is what the jury uh, decided? Is is there, I am really curious how that played out or what the judge said. It's like, well, I think that you, you know, deserve something. Here's $1. How does that play out? You know, it plays out in a very interesting way because you got to remember without damages, you don't have a cause of action for breach of contract. So if they don't have a cause of action for breach of contract, they couldn't seek their legal fees in the other part of the contract. So the judge did them a huge favor by giving them the $1 as nominal damages so that that way they can go ahead and seek counsel fees. 
So that was an issue on appeal, and I, I fought that issue. I lost that issue. But uh, bottom line is, is it gave them the leeway to seek um, council fees. Oh, okay. That's interesting. And I guess a little unfortunate, but nevertheless, it's, it's it still must have made, at least in the moment, kind of a... It, to me, it sounds like it would play out almost like a sitcom and just have been hilarious, but no, maybe not. I'm I'm not a legal expert myself, <laughs> um, um, so that is what it is. It, it, it saved it saved their cause of action for for breach of contract. Gotcha. Well, uh, you know, hopefully, in the end, justice was served in some capacity. That almost feels like this could answer the next question, but I'm sure you've also dealt with absurdities, things that just like. You you can't believe it's happening the way it's happening. Or, you know, if I told you this was happening, if I wrote this into a book, you'd think this was the most made up thing ever. Have you encountered in your practice of law um, anything that was just particularly absurd that just made you take a step back and go, why is this even happening? Or what in the world is going on here? This is just just crazy. Well, yeah. I mean, even the other case that I just referenced to. I mean, he had a ton of lawyers. Uh, he's a rich hedge fund manager. He has to see that he doesn't even have an expert that's willing to say, these are my damages. Okay. He can't quantify them. I mean, so it's an unbelievable prospect. You know, why are you even bothering to go to trial? I mean, why are you bothering with any of this except for spite or malice? Um you know, we see that in custody cases all the time, too. Like, why is the judge not seeing my good dad or my good mom for who or, you know, what she is? You know, why are they seeing this person in a negative light? Um, and you find those things to be absurd as well. I mean, you just don't understand them. But that's part of the fluidity of the litigation process. Sometimes people just don't like other people. We all work through psychological filters. And those psychological filters dictate to a certain extent how, why, and what we see in this world. Have you ever had almost the opposite of that happen where you're working with someone in the process of their divorce and you help them somehow reconcile and they decide to not go through with the process after all? Does that does that happen uh, frequently or, or almost never at all? We've had reconciliation, sure. Um, they normally don't work. I mean, they normally don't only last a couple of months, maybe a year. Um, you know, they're not long lasting prospects. You know, once you've uh, slung mud at each other in a courtroom, uh, it's difficult to reconcile. Um, but we've had a few of them. Some of them lasted a, a little bit longer than the others, but for the most part, no, they don't last. Curious. Um, have you ever found yourself in a position where, Maybe your client says, I want full custody of my children. And even you think maybe it's not in the best interest of all parties involved. And if that's the case, what do you do when that happens? The only party I have to worry about is my client. Okay. And when I talk to my clients about it, if it's something they want, okay, I start to question them as to why they may want it. Is this a matter of spite? Is this a matter of ill will? Is this a matter of just going after something because you desire it, you know? Or do you really think you can be the better parent? If they're doing it for what I would say is a frivolous basis, which would be running up the other side's legal fees or doing something which is illicit in nature to try and drag the process on, okay, uh, or extend the process for no reason, I'm not going to do it. I just tell them outright. It's just not going to happen, at least not with me. You know, okay. you can find a different lawyer to do that. That's good. But it makes sense. It's part of counseling. <laughs> well, there you go. It is, you know, you're you're there. You're again, you're the you're the Sherpa. You're the legal Sherpa. Um, we hear a lot of talk about fathers' rights these days, and it feels like if, you know. Both parts are parents, you know, uh, both sides are parents. They, they should have equal rights. I, I know that some people say that's just not the case and courts tend to side with mothers far more than fathers. Tell me about father's rights. Tell me how you incorporate that into your practice and, and what it means to 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 guard that and protect that for your clients. It's a matter of working with dads. You know, it, it's a matter of reminding them to a certain extent, you know, 
what it is that they want and who it is that they are. I mean, when you're starting a father's rights case, you're not going to take an uninvolved father and suddenly make him super dad. You have to look at the fathers who are the super dads and say, you know what? We don't want you cut short in the kids' lives and actually fight to get either a 50-50 split or some other split which is larger than what most other people are getting. OK, from the dads who just want to be the weekend dad or, you know, the dads who are going to put work first or the dads who are going to put money first or the dads who are going to put their love lives first. You know, these people are starting off as good dads. OK, so you're not fighting a frivolous battle. You're fighting for something which they have in their lives, which they just simply want to maintain. I mean, if the dad is, was getting up with the baby, you know, three nights a week and mom was getting up four nights a week, does that mean he should have less time with the baby? No. He should have an equal amount of time with the baby. He was doing an equal amount of work. In fact, maybe he was working the job, supporting the wife, supporting the baby, and still getting up three nights a week, three nights a week with the baby. He's already a super dad. He's already doing everything he can for his child to make the best of, of the, for the child's life. And we take those dads and we explain to them, put aside the anger, put aside the feelings, put aside the emotions. This is what we have to go to court. And this is what we have to do to try and accomplish getting you the maximum amount of time possible. I like how you put that, <laughs> put aside the anger, put aside the emotions. <laughs> this is, this is how we do it. This is what we have to do. That makes sense. Yes. Um, well, Yoni, I don't want to take up your entire afternoon, uh, and I appreciate the time you've already given us. Um, so here in a minute, what I'll do is I'll probably ask you my uh, my two wrap-up questions uh, as a reminder for you and for my listeners. Those will be, uh, A, if we can go back in time and, and give young Jonathan some advice, uh, what advice would you give yourself and, and, and why? Other than, again, the obvious, you know, buy a lot of Bitcoin, hold it till 60K. Um, and then also, if you could change one law, uh, big law, little law, national law, state, county, whatever it happens to be, um, what law would you change and why? While you're percolating on that, I'm going to jump back over here and we're going to take another look at your website. Again, I am talking with Jonathan Leverett of the Leverett's Law Firm. That is leverettslaw.com. Uh, as always, we will have a link in the description down below. Uh, if you find yourself uh, looking into needing a family attorney, you're in the New York area. Uh, obviously, I think Jonathan and his uh, law firm would be a wonderful resource for you. You can call them at eight, or sorry, 718-942-4004. Uh, That's 718-942-4004. You can also check them out online. I'm sure they have a little contact us button up at the top there, and uh, you can get in touch with somebody uh, who can guide you through the process of whatever family law issue it is that you are having. Uh, our final sponsor for today is Rank With News. If there is a guaranteed way to get your law firm or business featured in major national publications like Yahoo News, Forbes, Bloomberg, and others, and to see those articles rank locally, even nationally, sometimes in under eight hours for major competitive words that people were actually searching for, and it filled up your credibility, what else would you need to know? Rank With News is simply the most powerful way to hit page one, usually in under two weeks, functionally guaranteed. It's like search engine optimization guaranteed on steroids, ranking quickly and sticking indefinitely. Visit rankwithnews.com to learn more and book a time to speak with a specialist about featuring your firm or your business in major national eight-figure traffic sites that can help launch you to page one in a matter of hours, help you dominate your local marketplace, get media exposure, rank higher in Google, build credibility, and win more customers and clients with rankwithnews.com. All right. So, Final two questions, Jonathan. Uh, question number one, we're able to go back in time. We, uh, we maybe 2004, 2005, uh, maybe we meet a young Jonathan fresh out of law school and you're able to go over and just give yourself some, some really quick advice. What advice would you give yourself and why? Focus more on securities law. Focus more on dealing with people in the securities industry. I, uh, I have a securities background. I have a, uh, a BS in uh, business management. And I think I shortchanged myself in terms of not dealing enough on the business end. I enjoy the forensics because of the business uh, uh, angle to them. Um, but uh, I would probably focus more on uh, business litigation and uh, uh, 
uh, dealing with uh, business related issues. Gotcha. Is that a shift you think you could still implement in your practice at this point, or are you pretty much committed in the direction that you're going? What would that even look like? Well, I, I do enjoy the hedge fund cases. I do enjoy the securities cases when I deal with, uh, you know, registered broker dealers or I deal with the registered investment advisors. I do enjoy those cases more. Um, is it something I can implement? Yes, probably. Um, but um, at this point in time, I'm happy with where things are. I like doing the business end of things, you know, in terms of whether it be, you know, just regular business owners, uh, commercial oriented cases. But I would like to do, I would say, more securities based than business based when possible. Gotcha. It's interesting. And, uh, you know, well, hopefully you can you can uh, transition a little bit to that direction. We'll, we'll see. Um, question number two. This is my magic pen. I discovered it one day, and uh, it has unique properties in that it lets you strike a law that's currently on the books. It lets you edit a law that's on the books, or it lets you add a new law that isn't on the books that you think should be there. If I were to loan you my magical pen, Yoni, and you were able to make one change, again, adding, subtracting, or, or editing a law that's on the books, big law, little law, major ramifications, just minor annoyance, what law would you change and why? I think I would change the spousal support and child support laws to include state and local taxes. The state and local tax burdens have been increasing. We no longer get to deduct, you know, real estate taxes and other taxes, you know, as a result of the uh, uh, SALT provisions uh, that uh, President Trump put into place with regard to state and local taxes, you know, being deductible. Um, we no longer get to deduct maintenance as an expense, you know, that the other person has to pay taxes on. Um, the tax burden is heavier on citizens in general. Inflation has taken a huge chunk out of uh, people's income. Uh, it's difficult to go to the grocery store and actually get a full order for less than $200 or $300. And we're all suffering on that front. Uh, gas has come down a little bit, but not a lot. And I think that in general, people are paying too much uh, for certain types of support and that other people have to make greater contributions. There have to be there are too many unequal marriages. Let me put it that way. There there are marriages where, you know, you're each making, let's say, 150. We're OK, fine, whatever. You know, you can kind of even things out to a certain extent. But when you have these marriages where people are making five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars and the other side is making thirty thousand or forty thousand dollars, the amount of support that they're paying from their net paycheck is just so high. It's prohibitive in nature. So that's where I would modify the law if everything was up to me, of course, which is not. <laughs> Well, if you guys agree with uh, what Yoni said, call your uh, local representative and, uh, you know, see if you can get on that. So uh, action, action always is the way you make things happen. Action, action, action. Well, uh, Jonathan, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with me and, and my listeners today. I've enjoyed the conversation, learned a couple of things. My, my favorite conversations are always the ones where I learned something or I, I kind of reframe how I look at something. Um, and, and so I always appreciate that. I do like to let my my uh, guest have the final word. So are, is there any parting words of wisdom, any last thoughts? Uh, any advice that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Be the best parent you can be. Always be there for your kids, no matter what time the court gives you. And remember that they're children and they're innocent parties. That okay. is wonderful. Wonderful advice. And I think if more people followed that advice in general, I think the whole world would be a better place. So if you're out there and you've got kids, go spend time with them. Tonight, after watching this video, go home. Absolutely. Spend time with your kids. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this has been the Attorney Post. I have been talking with uh, Jonathan Leverett, who runs the Leverett's Law Firm. Again, leverettslaw.com, 718-942-4004. Uh, as always, though this podcast does deal with a lot of legal issues, it does not constitute legal advice. So if you find yourself in a legal issue where you need the advice of a competent attorney in your area, please always seek the advice of a competent attorney 
in your area. Obviously, if you're in the New York area and you need help with a family law issue, I think Jonathan, uh, Jonathan and, and his law firm would be a wonderful resource for you. So again, links, phone number, and all that will be in the description down below. Um, because again, as I always say, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. And so the step number one is just figuring out what your rights are and where you stand. This has been the Attorney Post. I am your host, Justin West. If you're listening to this on YouTube, we always appreciate a like, a subscribe, and a share. If you're on any of the other podcast platforms, rate us, review us, whatever it is. And of course, if you know somebody who could benefit from this information, please feel free to share this podcast with them. Help them get the information they need so that they can know their rights. And that way, they can have their rights. Until next time, this is Justin. Stay safe. And bye-bye.